Well, I want to um, ask for your um, forgiveness. I, I'm not in a suit, I realize that. I've actually been under the weather and haven't been feeling well. And what I'm wearing is actually the most comfortable because my body temperature has been changing because of my cold and a fever. So if, uh, if not being in a suit today is a hindrance for you, I want you to know why I'm not in one and uh, just look beyond that and be okay. Uh, you know, it's, I'm thinking about where we are in this, in this series. It's important for us to, to really be thinking about what it means to have gratitude. And I, I have two, sermon, or, uh, two scriptures that uh, I wanted to just kind of lift up this morning. The first is Isaiah 55, 2. And the second one we're going to look at will be out of uh, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, Philippians 4, 11 and, and, uh, through 13. And what we find out here are some amazing things about gratitude and generosity. Let me begin with Isaiah 55, 2. Now, this is some great wisdom that God is giving to us, and we talked about a couple of weeks ago how it's important for us to have scriptural wisdom and how the Bible speaks about wisdom and the importance of that. And here we're drawn right back to that again when uh, the scripture says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. So we're, we're seeing right out of the gate that we are to look at not spending money on things that don't bring the kind of nurture or the kind of depth for what our soul needs, to not be frivolous with things. We also find out in uh, Paul's letter to the church in Philippi that we see some great things that are happening here. And Paul is reflecting to the church as he's given thanks or demonstrating gratitude for their gifts. And he is um, talking about in this portion of the letter how grateful he is to God for the heart, the spiritual heart of giving of the church of Philippi. And he writes, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. And that's really important because what Paul is saying is that he has discovered what it means to be content in life, that he has moved himself beyond this need for more, and he has found contentment. He said, I know what it's to be in need, and I know what it's to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then he goes off and uh, talks to us a little bit about um, a very important piece that a lot of us hang our hats on. He says, how can I do all of this? Because obviously he can't do it on his own. He says, I can do all these things through Christ who gives me strength. And we learn with uh, great edification here what the great apostle is, is saying to us with regard to having gratitude. And I was thinking about you know, the, the story that I told you opening up this morning, and I was thinking about gratitude as we were putting this message together and, and what it means to be joyful. And, and the word gratitude, joy, and happiness sometimes can be synonymous in the English language. And uh, sometimes we, we kind of lose the sight of some things. But what I'm really looking at, when I talk about gratitude in God, when I talk about joy, when I talk about happiness, I'm not talking about worldly stuff. I'm talking about what it means to have um, an, an anchor in our faith, the things that come from eternal, eternal gratification, the things that come from God, and the things that we can lean into and that we know are truth beyond all things. And I got to thinking about how I really believe that, that all of us desire to be happy. And, and I bet if I were to ask you, do you desire to be happy? The majority of you would probably say yes. And some of you might say yes, but, and, and it's because of something that's going on in your life right now. But I find it really hard to believe that any of us wake up in the, in the first part of every morning and we say out of our mouths, Lord, help me to be unhappy with anything that happens today. I mean, we just don't do that. So that, that whole piece of happiness is part of our DNA, and, and it's, it's one of those things that God teaches us, that we are to uh, open up our hearts and our days uh, joyful and happy and, and with contentment in all that God has, has given to us. Now, we've been spending some time in this series, and we've been trying to talk about what wisdom says about how we are to manage our finances. We've talked a little bit about what it means to have a, a giving heart, what it means to um, not desire or to lust after the things of, of that our neighbors have and all of that. 
that. And today we're going to talk about, you know, how we don't have to wait to be happy, how we don't have to wait to be joyful, but that it's really here. And we can proclaim those words with great strength, with great generosity, or with great um, authenticity, I should say, that gratitude is here. And uh, sometimes, though, what we find out is that, that we struggle with really finding out what does it mean to be happy. Now, let me let, let you on a little study. There was a study that was done a couple of years ago, and that study said that people who are happy live longer. In fact, there's a lot of studies that say how laughter can improve your life. And, and if you find a way to laugh about things rather than, you know, uh, living in uh, drudgery and all those kind of things. So, so happiness brings about a longer life. In fact, some of the studies say that if you're a happy person, that you get sick less often. Now, it doesn't say that you won't ever get sick, but it says that your, your um, ability to get sick is left off, less often if you are happy because you're releasing endorphins and a lot of things that are in our bodies naturally that God created us to have, that when we're happy, or we seem to have a greater outlook on life. But in that study, they also found that as they did a poll, they, they asked some questions and they said, what are the top three things that bring about true happiness in life? And the first thing that they came up with was relationships. And what they learned was that they said, people said that we're happiest when we're in loving relationships. And what those loving relationships mean is that, that you are loving your children, you are loving your spouse, you are loving your grandchildren, you are loving your parents, that you have friends that you love and you're spending all your time dealing in those loving relationships. So whenever we're in loving relationships, we're happier. They also learned a second piece was they said, when, when we become a people who serve others, that when you find yourself serving someone else, that there's something that changes within you, that, that when you serve someone else, you take kind of the spotlight off of yourself. And no matter how difficult a day that you're having, when you actually serve someone else or give in love to someone else, you find out how that brings happiness in your life. A third group said it's actually it was faith, that, that when they were living in their faith, when they were leading someone to Christ, when they were praying with, with someone else, when they were reading scriptures, when they were talking about the love of God with others, when they were surrounded in an accountability group of loving one another in the name of Jesus Christ, that they found uh, great gratitude and found deepness and happiness. And I decided to use my wife, Patty, as a control group. And I said, Patty, what is it that brings you the greatest level of self-satisfaction and the greatest level of gratitude? You know what she said? Chocolate. <laughs> you know, so, amen. There you go. That must have been Bonnie. There you go, Bonnie. So whether it's, so whether it's loving relationships, whether it's serving, whether it is, um, you know, uh, dealing with um, helping others and, and whether it's um, giving out in grace and those kind of things, or whether it's chocolate, you know, God has wired us in our DNA to be a people that, that bring about a, a great deal of love. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. In fact, a lot of what Pastor BJ and I have been teaching you the last couple of weeks are things that we know. In fact, it, my guess is that if we were really to examine life, and if we were to ask ourselves, what should I do in this life situation, you know, not only does the Scripture tell us that, but we have already been cultured and cultivated in the love of God to know what the wise thing or the right thing to do is. So the things that we've talked about, how do you find happiness by loving relationships, by giving to others, and through faith and, and all those things, this isn't new. So we've just been kind of lifting up to you a little reminder because what happens is we get so caught up in what the world wants from us that we lose sight of the things that God teaches us. And the world's desires, the world's wants, the world's pressures can overwhelm us at a point that if we're not careful, we can actually lose sight of the direction that God is wanting us to have. Remember wisdom literature? And we take the direction of the world and we find out that we're not seeking or finding happiness at all. Now, here's what I found out about what the world teaches. The world teaches that um, we, can, we can find happiness, but it's, it's on a short-term basis. And the world usually teaches us it's about something that we must do or acquire. Here's how it works. The world says that if you're making $40,000 a year, that it says to you, if you could just make $60,000 a year, you'd be happier. The world says if you're making $100,000 a year, if I could just make $250,000 a year, I'd be much happier. And it's not just with the money pieces that go with that. It also comes with a lot of the possessions and the things that we have. Maybe you have conversations with yourself that says, if I could just move into that gated community in that beautiful model home that I just happened to just walk through today, man, I'd really be happy. Or maybe you, you're at Starbucks and you pull up next to a fancy schmancy new car and you're looking at that and saying, man, if I could drive that, I'd be happy. 
But here's what happens. Again, happiness of the world does not last forever. Happiness from God does. What happens with the world is you buy off that brand new car, you drive it off the showroom floor. Um, not only when you take it off the lot does it depreciate in value 30%, maybe even more, but that new car smell, it goes pretty quickly once the dog loads in and a couple of other things, you know. And then you start thinking about that house that you have to have, that beautiful palatial home. And all of a sudden you stretch your means and, and it brings you instant gratification because you have that house that you've always dreamed of. But then you kind of go into depression as you write out that monthly mortgage payment that you can't afford because your eyes and your heart were too bigger than the things that you really could see. You know, King Solomon, Solomon realized that Solomon was the son of King David. And, and Solomon said this, Solomon said, you know, um, he, was, he was far richer than any other person from what we can see from what the Bible says. And Solomon said, you know, with everything that I have, anything that I could afford, all of those things, Solomon says, that at the end of his life, he began to reflect and he began to ask himself, where am I on the scale of happiness? Here's what he writes in Ecclesiastes 2, 10, and 11. He said, I, I, I uh, denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. This is a man that had 1,500 women in his concubine. So he refused his heart no pleasure. My, my heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward of all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless like chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. I mean, here's a guy who had everything at his fingertips. He could buy anything. He could acquire anything. He was given gifts of riches and, and vast wealth from the people that were part of his kingdom. And at the end of his life, he said, it doesn't matter. I still don't have happiness. Um, it's written in Isaiah 55 too. Let's go back to our, our opening text. Um, it says, why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what doesn't satisfy? So it kind of puts us in that, that, that mode of toiling. Why are we working so hard? Why are we doing so many things on things that don't matter? And why are we spending on things that don't have value that come long term? So I want us to kind of resonate a little bit on what I call the keys to happiness this morning. And I hope that you'll write down some notes in your in your bulletin, and, and let this kind of uh, be a closeout of where we are financially, of what God says about church uh, personal finances and the ways that we deal with things. Let's go back to loving relationships. And that really is the starting point. Truth be known, you know, we, we hang around people, and if we spent more time, you know, loving one another, we'd see a great value difference in the life that we have. Whenever our staff gets together here at St. Paul, we, we come to a very uh, quick conclusion, and that is that we spend more time with each other than we do our spouses, our loved ones, and the other people that we might care about in our life. So, so we better like each other. We better get along, and, and we, we better you know, come to that uh, way of, of knowing what that loving relationship is. But you know, loving relationships goes a lot further than the meet and greet that we do on Sunday mornings. It's more than shaking hands with blessed be the tie and, and those things. Where we begin to see loving relationships, we begin to see those formed in our Sunday classes. We see them formed in our source groups. We see them formed in our adults, our children, and our youth ministries. We see them formed in our choirs. We see them formed also in our praise team. We see them formed in all the ministries that we have here at St. Paul. And it's as we begin to formulate and reach out to one another and love each other through those ministries, we begin to see the significance of what the biblical understanding of what loving relationships is all about. The second piece that we see is expressions of gratitude. Expressions of gratitude. Now, this is one of those things of, of asking ourselves, what is it that I'm grateful for? And I asked you that question as I ended at the very beginning, you know, what is it that you're grateful for? And what are you willing to do in serving God with that which you're grateful for? Paul writes this as he uh, was really struggling to the church of Thessalonica. He said, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now, we have to understand what's going on when he writes this. This is coming from a man that once he gave his life to Christ, once he had that road to Damascus experience, once he went and saw Ananias and those scales were lifted from his eyes, when he realized that he was not serving God as a Pharisee, but he was legalistic, he, he knew God by knowledge and not by heart. 
not by transformation, that once he gave his life and transformed in Christ, we begin to see that his life was not filled with a lot of good things. I mean, here's a guy that was imprisoned because of what he believed. Here's a guy that was beaten for what he believed. Here's a guy who ultimately lost his head <coughs> because, of what, <coughs> because of what he believed. And we see that there's a time for gratitude, that even in those circumstances when life is not working out the way that we would hope it to work out, that Paul says that we must show gratitude even in those very difficult things that come our way. We find out also that it's the acts of kindness. Now, so, we, so it's loving relationships, it's gratitude, and it's acts of kindness. And when we think about acts of kindness, what we really be begin to think about is how we show gratitude, how we show happiness, how we have joy in our life is when we learn to serve someone else. If you serve only yourself, I guarantee you, you will not find happiness and total joy in life. If you serve yourself and no one else, I don't care how hard you work at it, you will not find happiness and joy. But what, what we learn from what the Scripture says is when we enact acts of kindness, when we reach out in the name of Christ, when we reach out in His name and touch and bless the life of someone else through serving or through giving or demonstrating the gratitude that comes from that, we begin to see the changes and the efficacy of what our faith is in Christ. We begin to see that we are called to a higher purpose. You know, Ego is probably one of the greatest things that separates us from each other and from God. And you know what ego stands for, E-G-O, edging God out. So if you're constantly thinking of yourself, if you're constantly worrying about yourself, if you're constantly just focusing on your own needs, your own wants, your own desires, your own pains, um, all the things about yourself, you are edging God out. And God's Word says that, that we must raise our eyes off of ourselves and we must learn how to serve someone else. One of the greatest uh, parables that I love is the sowing parable. We talked about that not long ago. And here's what I love about it. When I have people who come talk to me and, and they sit down in my office or we sit down over a cup of coffee and, and they start talking to me about how they're not happy with life or that they don't find much joy, or um, they're having challenges with their spouse, and they, they're not getting the love that they need, and all those things. My, my answer to all that is, you reap what you sow. And, and here's biblically how that works. If there's something that you need in life, you must sow it before you can reap it. If you feel you need more love in your life from your spouse, then you need to sow love into your spouse, and then your spouse will uh, you'll reap that back. If you need more joy in your life, you need to give joy away so that joy will come to you. If you need more um, peace in your life, you need to be a peaceful person and give peace away so that peace comes to you. And that's kind of how the sowing and reaping parable works. And those are the things that we see through those acts of kindness and the things that, that bring us to where we need to be. Micah writes it this way. Micah says, take a, a broader spectrum of where this needs to be. He says, he has showed you, um, oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? He says, when you think about what God requires of you, he says, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. And he said, when you do that, you are demonstrating acts of kindness. You know, the proverb says this, he says, he who pursues righteousness and love finds life, prosperity, and honor. We are meant to do good for one another. We are meant to serve one another. And how do we know how to serve? Because Christ served us. When he came and he washed the feet in John 13, when he went to the cross, he came as, as serving the Father and serving us through his sacrifice. And through that, we have a demonstration of what it means to give away so that we might see the blessing that comes from that. Demonstrating love through generosity. That's the, uh, that's the next piece of the things that we see. Demonstrating love through generosity. You know, what are we doing with what we have? How are you, how am I, how are we becoming a generous person? Are we at that point in our life where, like in 1987 Christmas Eve, that God is speaking to you to finally release that which you've been holding on to and to receive the blessing that he's given? Well, let me share with you a little story. March 30th, 1975, Bertha Adams um, died in New York. 
Now, here was a woman when they did an autopsy on her body. They found out that she was emaciated. She was dehydrated. She starved to death. She was nothing but bones with just a little bit of skin on her that um, she, she didn't have enough to eat. And they realized that she didn't have any heat in her house. And through those winters and all, that she probably even had, uh, was freezing to death. But anyway, when they found her and they did an autopsy on her body, they found out that this was probably a woman who fell underneath the net of the social umbrella that we know of, of, of social services, of helping. But here's the interesting thing. When they went into Bertha Adams' house and they began to look around and take ownership, or, or I should say, uh, when they began to inventory uh, all of her personal items, what they realized that there was no food in the cupboards. There was no food in the refrigerator. Uh, you know, she, she just didn't have anything at all. She had her water turned off because she couldn't pay her bill. But then they found two keys. Now, the police officers that did the inventory, they looked at those keys and they said, these keys look familiar. And one of them happened to say, these are keys to a safe deposit box. So thinking one and two together, that, that here's a woman who probably lived like a hermit who lived in her home and didn't walk very far. There was a bank across the street from her, from her apartment there in New York. So they went across to that bank and they said, do these keys fit any of your safe deposit boxes? And the clerk looked at it and said, that's definitely our key. It had a number. They went in. They put the keys in. They opened up their safe deposit box. Do you know what they found in this woman's safe deposit box? $799,000 of cash. They began also to find um, liquid stocks, bonds, um, all sorts of assets that were just stored away there. That, that what was in that safe deposit box was in value well over a million and a half dollars. I mean, here was a woman who, who didn't understand what it meant to give generously. Here's a woman who, who even killed herself because she felt she had to hold on to everything that she had. And when I read the Bible, what I learned from what the Bible says is that God says that we are to hold on to that which he gives us loosely so that way we can freely give to those who are in need and to change the lives of the world that's around us. God says to Abraham, Abraham, do you know why you're so blessed? Because you, Abraham, are a blessing to many. Jesus said this. Jesus said in, in Luke 6, 38, Give and it'll be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It'll be poured into your lap. I don't know how much closer that can be than in your lap. For with the measure that you use will be the measure that you will be given. The writer of Proverbs says a generous man will prosper. He who refuses others will himself be refreshed. He who refreshes others himself will be refreshed. So do we see how the scripture is talking to us about how we are to be generous to others and how we are to give faithfully for the work of God? When I was growing up, one of the great challenges that I saw that was a battle in our home uh, when I was a little boy was uh, my parents uh, occasionally went to church and my mom was always the one that, that kind of drove that train to, to load us up in the car and get there. And, and that was before my dad had really given his life to the Lord. Today he's given his life to the Lord and he's a great leader um, in his church and, and in his faith. But back then I can remember how mom and dad really struggled about what should we do. And dad worked for a company that always had this big United Way campaign. And he was always arguing with mom, we need to give money to the United Way. You know, we need to do this and we need to give to the Red Cross. We need to do all those things. Folks, those are great organizations. But let me tell you, those organizations, through their generosity and what they do, don't bring about salvation. And, and the scripture is very clear. It says in Malachi 3.10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse of the Lord. The storehouse of the Lord is the local church. And God says that that which you are prayerfully looking to give, bring it into the storehouse, the local church, and let God use that to bring salvation to the world. And I began to see a, a change in my own dynamics of how I even, through the years, began to see how to give different things. And I went and, and realized that, that we're to give to God first. And then if there's anything left over, we give to United Way, Red Cross, and the other good organizations that are there because I realized that the church was a central place for God's plan for salvation into a broken world. You know, we're at a point this morning where, where that's exactly where we are. We're, we're here today with our faith promise cards. And uh, you received a letter from me a couple of weeks ago. You've been getting uh, a weekly blog from me, and we've been talking about it the last couple of weeks, and today's the day that we are going to dedicate those faith promise cards. And the reason why we at St. Paul today don't call it a pledge card 
is I don't want you making a pledge. I want you to make a faith promise, which means I don't want it to be something that you're doing by yourself. That's what a pledge is. I pledge to do this. I want you to enter God into the conversation. And I want you faithfully promising to God that which you will faithfully do in serving his ministry through the local church. And we're going to take these cards and we're going to begin to see what God is going to do with those. But here's what happens. You know, the question that I get asked an awful lot is, well, well what should I give? When I think about, you know, that question, I realize in my own life through many years, I had gotten to a point where I was all over the place with what should I do? You know, the Old Testament talks about a tithe, the 10% of the first fruits of that which comes uh, from what God gives to us. You know, people will say, but the New Testament doesn't talk about a tithe. But, you know, when I read the Scriptures, here's what I see the Scriptures say, that God desires us to give proportionately based upon the blessing that we've been given. Now, what that means is somebody who makes $100,000 will give more than somebody who gives $10,000 or who makes $10,000. It's proportionate. And we begin to see the significance that comes from that. And we realize that, that God didn't call us all to give the same numeric gift, but God says, take a look at how I've blessed you and proportionately give back so that the church, through my work, can make a bigger difference. And here's what he said to the children of Israel. He said, a tithe of everything from the land, from grain, from the soil or fruit, from the trees, belongs to the Lord. So it's not a suggestion it's actually he's commanding us to return to him. And, but here's the key. It's holy for the Lord, which means that that which we give has a purpose. And it's not just something that, that we hear pastors saying we need to do, and oh, because my pastor says I need to do this, I need to do this. It's much bigger than that. That which we give has a holy purpose. And God says, use that in the way in which it is. I love the story of Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall was the chaplain for the United States Senate many years ago, and he talks about a story how a man came to him one day. And the man said, uh, Pastor Marshall, he says, I'm, I'm having a very difficult time in my life. He said, back when I made $20,000 as my total income, it wasn't any problem at all for me to write a check for $2,000 and give it back to God's work. But here's my problem. Ever since I started making $200,000, I just find it impossible to write out a check of $20,000 to give back for God's work. And he says, and I haven't been able to, to give or tithe or, or, or give an offering ever since I've been at this new income level. And I'm really struggling with this. And Pastor Marshall looked at the man. He said, do you really want to be healed of this? And the man said, yes, sir, I really do. And Pastor Marshall said, well, let's get on our knees. And he, he said, hold my hand. And he said, now I'm going to pray for deliverance for you to take this away from you so that you no longer struggle with this. And the man said, oh, Pastor Marshall, that's exactly what I want. And Peter Marshall held the man's hands. He said, Lord God. My brother here is in a dilemma. Lord, he wants to serve you. He loves you. He wants to tithe. And Lord, when he earned $20,000, he tithed liberally at $2,000 a year. But Lord, he says that since he's been making $200,000, that he can't tithe anymore. So Lord, free my brother, liberate him, restore him back to that salary he made years ago <laughs> when he could tithe back to your work in the church. And I would have given anything to have seen the face of that man. But see, that's what happens. You know, we get to this point where, where we say, you know, I want to sacrificially be a part of God's purpose. And then all of a sudden we see changes in our incomes. We get a bonus or uh, we'll get a raise or something else. And, and we so quickly want to just put that back into ourselves. And I want to challenge us to say, you know, when you pay off a, when you pay off a debt or when you pay off your debts, or, or when you pay off your car, or whatever, before just going and reinvesting in yourself, take a step back and say, how can I bless God with a portion of what this new found freedom has given to me that I can add to what the Lord is doing? You know, it's, it's hard. I mean, we think about that. It, it comes down to how can I use this extra that I have? But God says to us, he says, take the step Give back to me, return to me. Not only does it belong to me, the Lord says, but what you give is holy. And I think that's the key piece that we so often miss when we talk stewardship in the life of the church. It usually comes across as being some big fundraiser. Folks, this is not a fundraiser. This is to do the holy work of Christ and to be able to make an impact in the difference in the life of the people of God. 
You know, as I, as I looked over the, the number of pledges in 2011 made for 2012, uh, what, what I learned was uh, the pledges brought forth for 2012 was the largest number of pledges, uh, Horton tells me, is the largest number of pledges that this church has ever committed to in pledges. Now, what I did when I looked at that, I realized that, that you get it. And I just want to say thank you. You get what it means to participate in God's ministry. You get what it means to lead people to Christ. You get, and what you know is that by your gifts, that, that we can feed 20,000 people a year through open arms ministry. By your gifts and giving back to the church of Christ, that we begin to see uh, handicapable people, people who, whose, whose lives are, are, are handicapable, they, they understand that they are a child of God, and we become a church to, to everybody. You begin to see that through your giving, that men, women, and and children's lives are changed, that people are led to Christ. You know, two weeks ago or last week, we brought in 13 new members, of which seven came by profession of faith, which means they have never, ever professed their faith in Christ before. And that's the power of what happens, and that's why the church makes a difference. But let me just say this also. I want you to trust the decisions made by people just like you. It's what we call our lay leadership team. In the United Methodist Church, I don't know if you all know this or not, pastors don't make decisions on how to spend money or on any of those things. Actually, in the United Methodist Church, it's led by lay volunteers. You elect them every year. So when it comes to staffing, lay people help figure out who will staff. When it comes to facilities, it's lay people who decide as a board of trustees what we'll do with our buildings. When it comes to finances, it's lay people who decide how we'll spend money. You know, unlike the Baptist church and some non-denominational churches, pastors, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we have a voice to be heard in that, but we don't have a vote. So, so it, doesn't, it doesn't count. It, the church is led by the people of God. And he, let me tell you some good things that the people of God have done here at St. Paul. They've paid down half of the outstanding building debt that we, that we currently have. So we've gone from a million dollars in, in indebtedness in a payment that was over $13,000 a month, and we have paid that down to a little over $500,000, and we've cut that payment to a little over $5,000 a month. Now, you might ask, why have we done it? Two reasons. Number one, the Scripture says that we should never be in debt, and we should not be a slave to the lender. That's number one. But number two, by paying down that debt, what it allows us to do is to put more money into ministry. That instead of investing in bricks and mortar and buildings and windows, we invest it in the hearts of God's people. And we lead people to Christ. I had a conversation with our head trustee not long ago, and I said, Don Brash, I said, I don't know if you're going to be happy or horrified with what I'm going to say. And he said, what's that? And I said, I don't think we need to go build any more buildings for a while. I said, I think we have all the facilities that we need. We just need to learn how to repurpose how we're using our buildings. And then after I was, uh, you know, putting that electronic thing to revive Don's heart, <clears throat> you know, that was a joke, folks. Uh, but Don was excited because he realizes that, that that's the purpose of where we're trying to go as a church. We're not building an earthly kingdom. We're building a heavenly kingdom. And that's the direction. So I want you to know that, that as you give, that those great decisions are being made in the name of Christ. Now, I want you to do something here. I want you to take out your faith commitment card. And I want you to, um, uh, there's, they're located in the pews. Maybe you've brought them with you. If you happen to put it in the offertory, don't worry about that. But I want you to look at that. And let me tell you what that means. That is a love commitment between you and God. All throughout this series, and as long as I've been senior pastor here at the church, I've never told you how much money you should give. I truly believe that is a prayerful commitment between you and God. And what I've learned in my own life is those whom God has blessed, much is asked in return. And I've realized that through my own life that as God has tested me on that, and as I have taken those steps faithfully myself along with Patty, that we begin to see great things coming. Now, some of you who are holding these faith commitment cards this morning, you're saying to yourself, I I've lost my job, or through a cutback, a layoff, or whatever the case may be. You might be holding on to that saying, but my retirement pension is less than it used to be. You know what? God says just to give proportionately. If your income has gone down, give proportionately. And that's all that God's asking for us to do, is to give a sacrificial gift 
in his service. Now, some of you who are holding the card, you're sitting there thinking like, you know, uh, before you just write down the same number you've written down the last three years, ask yourself, is now the time for me to take that additional step? Is it time for me to step up a little bit? For those of you who, who are in a difficult space right now, then maybe what you do on your faith commitment card is you write, I will give as I can. And then as God blesses you, then you bless God back in return. We want 100% participation. We want everyone to participate in the ministry of what God is doing through the life of St. Paul. And what I know is that if we all participated, and if all of God's churches participated in funding the ministries of churches that he has all across the world, that the church of Jesus Christ would, would not struggle as much as we oftentimes do. Now, let me end with this. When, when, when I look at um, my faith commitment card in Patty's, what I realize is when we hold this up, what I realize is we look at this as a time of gratitude for us. And we look at this and we say, you know, God, thank you. Thank you for blessing us with each other. Thank you for blessing us with two beautiful uh, young women. Thank you for blessing us with our grandchildren. Thank you, Lord, for the awesome privilege of allowing and humble privilege, allowing me to be a senior pastor of a church like this. God, thank you for all of our friends. Just thank you for everything. And so we see this as a time of gratitude a time of placing back to God. But what it also says to us is, as a faith commitment, it says this coming year, 2013, that this is what we make our commitment to first and foremost, that we will place God before every other thing in our life, every other want, every other desire, and we will trust faithfully that he will meet the needs that we have. You know, these cards are so important. And I'm so grateful for those who have already turned their cards in because they couldn't be here today. And this is the harvest that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. So I want you to um, understand one other thing. Patty and I, early on in our life, like I said earlier, we were tippers and takers. It was more about what the church could do for us than what we could do for the church. We would spend more money going out to dinner than we gave in the Sunday offering plate. So to me, on that Christmas Eve in 1987, when I stepped out and, and wrote out a pledge card for $500, that was a big step for me. And through the years, I've realized that we haven't always been tithers. But there was a time in our life where God helped us to get to that point. Every year, we just gave more and more and more, and then we became tithers. Now we're now what we call sacrificial givers. We give above the tithe. Now, I'm not telling you that so that you'll think, oh, you know, I don't say that in a prideful way. The reason I tell you that is this. I want you to know the character of your senior pastor. I want you to know that I don't ask you to do anything that, that I don't do myself. And I would never ask you to do anything I don't do myself. And we heartfully and lovingly do that. And we realize it's all for the good of Christ. So I want you to hold up your cards for a second. And if you would just bow your heads and close your eyes. Just hold up your cards up, up in the air so they can be seen this morning. Just hold them up. And I want you to pray this prayer with me this morning. I want you to pray it out loud with me. Thank you, God, for every blessing. I love you and want to follow you. Help me to grow in the grace of giving. Allow my faith commitment card to be an expression to you of my resounding gratitude in all you have given me. Please use my gifts to further your kingdom's purpose. And Lord, I pray that as a pastor here, that the sheep that you have called me and called Pastor BJ to lead, that Father, that we would lead them to hear your voice. Lord, I also want to pray for those who are struggling financially right now. I want them to know that all you ask is for them to sacrifice. And if it means to just put on the card, I will give when I can. If that's the sacrifice, then Father, help them with courage to do just that. But help them to realize the blessings that will come. For the rest of us, Lord, help us to grow in our grace of giving. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our uh, closing hymn this morning, I want to give an invitation. You'll see a couple of baskets um, up front here. 
And in this basket right here are the cards that we've already received from the, from the fountain service. And you'll also, um, or excuse me, these are the cards from our 930 sanctuary service. John um, Hamilton, our head usher, will bring up the red bag that has the cards from our fountain service. But I want you, as the Lord touches you during this final hymn, to just come up as he leads you and to place your gift in one of these baskets and that we might truly see the harvest come in the name of the Lord. So will you stand for our closing hymn? And as the Lord leads you, come and may we receive your gifts for the coming year.